Today I'm going to show you how I built the railroad complex at Evanston on my N-scale layout. Coming right up. I'm Roy Smith. Thanks for letting me share the amazing hobby of model railroading with you. As you may know, I am rebuilding the Evanston area of my layout from the ground up. To do this, I began to work on the railroad complex there last October. Today, I want to summarize for you the progress I have made using short video clips from each of the 22 episodes in which I built the railroad complex. Here you see a satellite view of the railroad complex on my layout. The complex features three primary structures. They are, from left to right, a roundhouse, machine shop, and powerhouse. I had to squeeze all three of these structures into a space measuring 42 inches long by 7 inches deep at its widest point in the center, narrowing down to 2.5 inches at either end. That's not a lot of space in which to build a railroad complex, even in end scale. The Union Pacific Railroad turned these structures over to the city of Evanston in 1972. And in 1998, the city began to renovate them for use in public events and as city office space. And I'm renovating the three structures on my layout as well by kit bashing them from commercial kits. I wanted the structures to appear as they do today and not as they appeared during the steam era. I will put a link to a playlist containing the 22 episodes, both at the end of this video and in the video description down below. You can go to the playlist to watch any or all of the episodes in their entirety. I hope my techniques will be useful to you as you work on your own layout. Okay, let's get started with this review of how I built the railroad complex, beginning with episode one in the series. In episode one, I described Evanston as the most neglected area on my layout. I explained how, at long last, I wanted to get started on a much needed renovation of this area, and I told you what I planned to do. I've been talking about the changes I'd like to make in Evanston for a long time now without doing much of anything. Well, it's time to start working on this long neglected area of my layout. I hope to begin by making a minor realignment in the arrangement of yard tracks, which I will describe in next week's layout update. In episode two, I made a significant change in the track arrangement at Evanston. I realigned the track in the rail yard to make it more satisfying, both operationally and cosmetically. How did I go from before to after? And why do I think the after version is so much better? That's what we're going to talk about in today's layout update. Here you see a better overview of the yard. And look at all of this additional space I now have here, thanks to the new track arrangement. This is where those structures for the former railroad complex will go. Next, in episode 3, sometimes we need to run trains through holes in our backdrops. That's what I needed to do when I added the Pocatello subdivision to my layout. But then we have to hide those holes. In this episode, I showed you how I did it using scenery and a highway overpass. This is what the hole through the backdrop has looked like for a long time. The two tracks passing through the hole are the beginning of the Pocatello subdivision, and the two parallel tracks in the foreground are the Evanston subdivision mainline tracks. I was able to partially hide the hole with a highway overpass after cutting the hole through the masonite. I've finished gluing on the rest of the layers of styrofoam. Now I'm applying sculpt mold on top of the styrofoam. The sculpt mold will seal the styrofoam and will provide a base for the application of subsequent scenery materials. Now let's run a train through the scene to double check the clearance. The following week in episode four, I continued to work on the scenery and the highway overpass to hide the hole through the backdrop. At the beginning of the week, the scene I'm working on looked like this. The hole through the backdrop is located on a curve in the backdrop, making it more challenging to hide the hole. Here's the scene with the highway overpass now in place. Adding a hill here will hide the overpass as it disappears into the backdrop.
In episode five, I continued to work on the Granger Junction area. I showed you how I installed feeder wires for the track, paved the road, and finished cutting and carving a hill. I'm going to apply a thin coat of spackling paste on top of the sculpt mold I put down last week. I'm going to do this to create a smooth road surface. Okay, I'm going to paint the road surface with this asphalt top coat from Woodland Scenics. Later on, I will weather the road using a diluted white paint. I start by using a hot wire cutter to do the larger carving. I do this right on the layout since it produces very little of those tiny beads of white styrofoam that tend to fly everywhere. There I've got it roughly shaped so at this point I'm going to do some finer cutting and carving using an old razor saw and an old X-Acto knife. And in episode six, I continued to work on the scenery at Granger Junction. I built abutments for the highway overpass. I painted the overpass a cement color and I applied earth colored pigments to the scenery. I insert the abutment in the hole. I test it by replacing the overpass temporarily to make sure that everything fits together and looks good. And now I have to install an abutment over here at the west end of the overpass. Okay, I did a couple of things off camera. I finished the west end of the overpass by installing the railings that came in the mail. I painted the overpass a concrete color. I added sculpt mold where needed in the scene, especially this area right here. I applied a base coat of diluted desert yellow latex paint to the entire scene. As the colors soak into the scenery and dry, the terrain will become lighter in color. I wired the yard tracks at Evanston in episode seven. Now I marked a spot where I will drill a hole to drop the feeder wires down through the plywood. And then I drill the hole. Now I drop the feeders through the hole and reconnect the track. I connect the feeder wires to terminal barrier strips and layout bus wires are also connected to the barrier strips. In episode 8, I explained that I wanted to create the illusion of a lower profile for the yard tracks so that the yard tracks appear to be lower than the mainline tracks. I showed you how I will create this illusion. If you look carefully, you might be able to see the difference in the profile of the mainline track where the intermodal train is running and the adjacent yard tracks. There, I've removed the track. Now I can lay the cork sheets. I mark and cut the cork to fit the space I have for the yard. I slide the second piece of cork under the main line and mark it for cutting to fit the yard space. And there it is, cut to fit the yard. Now I have to reinstall the track so that I can mark and then cut where the track will go. Remember, the cork will go between the tracks, not under the tracks. There, I've cut out the cork where the track goes. And once again, I've reinstalled the track. And now, the final step that I will be taking today. I'm painting the cork using a dark gray color. And turning to structures in episode nine, I showed you the three kits that I would be using in the railroad complex. I explained that all three had to be kit bashed in order to make them fit the available space and to make them resemble the prototype structures more closely. Right now, this is what Evanston looks like without structures. There's track and that's about it. Now, let me show you the kits I plan to use. They include a roundhouse, a machine shop, and a power plant. All three of these kits will have to be bashed into shallow 3D structures. In episode 10, I began to kit bash the three structures, including the roundhouse, 
machine shop, and the powerhouse. Of course, kit bashing is what we do when we modify commercial kits for use on our layouts by changing their size, shape, and even their function. I simply wanted to capture the feel of the railroad complex because it would be impossible to replicate it exactly. For some additional help in creating the scene, I put a satellite view of the complex up on the scenic divider. But I ended up having to put together a couple of walls for each structure to see how I could best place each structure and what modifications I would have to make on each one. Doing this allowed me to study them and move them around until I was satisfied with them. Did you notice how all three structures are set at angles and not parallel to the backdrop? This is intentional. Setting the structures at angles allows you to see at least two sides of every structure and not just one. It adds depth to the scene and it makes the scene more interesting. Let's go over to the workbench and start with the machine shop because that's the easiest one to modify. I continued to work on kit bashing the machine shop in episode 11. Now the machine shop of my layout looked like this at the end of last week's episode. Since then I've done more work and the machine shop now looks like this. As you can see, it's still far from finished. So how did I get from this on the left at the end of last week to this on the right? That's what I'm going to show you today. I began to kit bash the powerhouse in episode 12. The powerhouse provided electrical power to the railroad complex throughout the steam era. Unlike the machine shop and roundhouse, the powerhouse on the prototype has not been renovated by the city. It continues to be in a state of ruin, boarded up with broken windows and crumbling bricks. That's how I want it to appear on my layout. This is how we left the power plant at the end of our episode two weeks ago with the four walls held together loosely by blue painter's tape and waiting for something to be done. Remember, to fit the space here, I had to cut the walls of the power plant so that the structure is no longer rectangular, but rather trapezoid in shape. This unusual shape is not noticeable when viewed from the front of the layout. And here you have it. The base coat of paint is the same color I used on the machine shop. I worked on kit bashing the roundhouse in episode 13. Now it's time to go back to the roundhouse, the most challenging of the three structures. I am using this Walther's kit for the roundhouse, but I am drastically modifying it. This is how I left it after some initial surgery three weeks ago, with the walls loosely held together and held more or less in place by blue painter's tape. And this is how I left the photo of the prototype loosely affixed to the backdrop, also with painter's tape. I added this photo to the backdrop to create the illusion that the entire 28-stall roundhouse exists on my layout. And here's the roundhouse with the plastruck foundation. I couldn't use the foundation that came with the kit because of my modifications to the kit. I needed to glue the walls to the foundation in order to hold the structure together in a way that is very different from the original kit. In episode 14, I got back to work on the railroad complex after a period of time working on other projects. To be sure that I was getting the color correct, I first printed out a photo of the prototype on photographic paper. Then I mixed these colors of Tamiya acrylic paints together to come up with a match for the color of the prototype. I compared my paint job with the printout on photo paper because they have to match when I put the photo on the backdrop later on. It was definitely orange, but it seemed to match the prototype pretty closely. 
Next, I applied Tamiya Light Sand Weathering Pastel to the walls. This toned down the bright orange paint, making it look more realistic. And here you can see the results of doing this in a side-by-side -side comparison of the roundhouse and machine shop. So I applied Weathering Pastel to the machine shop as well. Next, in episode 15, I showed you how I created the illusion of a large roundhouse in a small space on my layout by using photographs and forced perspective to do this. Now this is what the roundhouse looked like at the end of my last layout update. And this is what it looks like now that it's done. I used a photo of the roundhouse doorways. I printed the photo out on photographic paper and cut it out. I glued it to styrene with spray adhesive. At this point, I was able to install interior and exterior lighting on the roundhouse. In episode 16, I showed you step by step how I modified the powerhouse to make it look more like the prototype. I also showed you how I weathered it heavily to make it look old, abandoned, and in a state of ruin. The last time you saw the powerhouse, it looked like this. And this is what it looks like today. I want to show you how I carried out this transformation. So I cut that trim off the old end and glued it onto the new end. And I used styrene for the new back on the structure. I cut out these two openings at the corner of the structure. In just a moment, I will install doors and windows here to match the prototype. I wanted the glass to be all cracked and broken, just like on the prototype, so I began to scratch it with an X-Acto knife to create the appearance of cracks. You can see the broken glass easier when I hold the window up to a light. Okay, I have installed all of the windows and doors. Next, the roof. And having cut the roof to match the trapezoid shape of the structure, I can now put it in place. I have boarded up some of the doors and windows like on the prototype, using styrene painted to look like old weathered plywood. Next, I went to install a skylight on the roof just like the one on the prototype. In order to create such a skylight, I'm using some windows that came with the kit. Here you can see the skylight on top of the roof. I have already painted and weathered it and the roof itself. Next, I'm going to weather the rest of the structure using pan pastels. I think this is the most important step in making the structure look old and abandoned and in a state of ruin, in sharp contrast to the machine shop and roundhouse, which have been renovated. In episode 17, I lighted up the railroad complex using the Woodland Scenics Just Plug Lighting System. I showed you the system components and I installed the system on my layout. This system is nice in a number of ways, which I discussed in this episode. A few weeks back, I installed lighting in the roundhouse at Evanston. And now at long last, I am going to show you how I did it. And I'm going to show you how I installed lighting in the powerhouse and the machine shop as well. This week, I finished assembling the machine shop and was able to install lighting in it using system components that I had been waiting for in the mail. I installed an LED light inside the structure and an LED nano light on the portico. Okay, here are all three of the structures in the railroad complex lit up. Let's go under the layout for a moment to see where I have placed the lighting controls within very easy reach on the benchwork. I showed you how I kit bashed a turntable for the roundhouse in episode 18. On the prototype, the turntable hasn't served locomotives in decades, but it is functional and you can ride on it during events at the railroad complex. On my layout, the turntable is a non-functional part of the background scene. I want to create a turntable for my layout that resembles the prototype at Evanston, Wyoming. 
I want it to look something like this. First, this Atlas N-Scale Truss Bridge Kit. I've already started to assemble the turntable. So what you see here are some leftover cut up pieces of the Atlas kit. You can see where the turntable will go. I have used pieces from the Atlas bridge kit to make an arch. The paint that I have been waiting on has just arrived in the mail. So now I can paint the turntable bridge black to match the prototype. Here you can see that I have installed the planking on the deck of the turntable bridge. Next up, the Fairmont Speeder. And here it is on the turntable. I showed you how I created photographic street scenes for the backdrop at Evanston in episode 19. The next thing I need to do is put some photos of structures on the backdrop where I am indicating. And as I said, that's what I'm going to do today. I take the little yellow man from the lower right hand corner of the screen and place him on Main Street. I walk him up and down Main Street, taking screenshots of structures as I go. Now I've got six photos taken along Main Street here in iPhoto on my MacBook Pro. Next I have to cut out the photos. And here are the photos in place. In episode 20, I installed pavements and street lamps in the railroad complex. I am going to be working on the area around the machine shop. First, I am going to pave the plaza at the entrance to the machine shop. I have used a pencil to mark the shape of the plaza. Okay, jumping ahead, you can see that I have finished installing the plaza and the sidewalk on the other side of the machine shop, three lamp posts, and two wooden pole lamps. Here are some closer views. First, the plaza area of the machine shop. You can see the ornamental trees that I planted. I created terrain around the structures in the railroad complex in episode 21. This, of course, is scenery work, which most of us enjoy doing. First thing I want to do is embed these short pieces of track around the turntable into the soil. Why would I want to do that? Because this is what the track looks like on the prototype at Evanston, Wyoming. As you can see, the ties and even a part of the rails are covered by dirt and debris. Now the next task in preparing the terrain around the structures is covering the joints and edges of the cork roadbed. I'm using spackling paste to do this. The spackling paste is dried completely. So now I can paint it starting with a base coat of Woodland Scenics Ochre Yellow. After that, I will apply washes of burnt umber and a little stone gray as I try to replicate the colors of the soil in the area that I am modeling. And finally, in episode 22, I showed you how I planted vegetation in the railroad complex. I applied ground cover, static grass, shrubs, and tufts. This is what the vegetation in the railroad complex looks like now. I'm going to show you how I did it. I am starting the process of planting vegetation by putting down ground cover. I'm using light green grass and yellow grass for this ground cover. And here's some of the static grass that I will be putting down. It's a variety of 2mm, 4mm, and 6mm tall grass in shades of light green, tan, and yellow. I hold the applicator as close as possible to the glue 
and shake on the static grass. You can see what the initial application of grass looks like. Now it's time to plant shrubs and tufts. These are the materials that I will be using. I have put some shrubs on one plate and glue on another plate, and I'm planting them at the powerhouse. And finally, I apply some yellow pan pastel. This seems to work better than the other techniques. It's amazing. Pan pastels are good not only for weathering rolling stock and structures, but I have discovered that they also work well when trying to vary the colors of foliage. I'm even applying some of the yellow pan pastel to the static grass. It lightens up the grass and allows me to vary the color of the grass from light green to a more yellow tone. The scene is essentially done. That's how I created the railroad complex at Evanston. I still have a few minor details to add to the scene because no part of my layout is ever completely done. But now it's time to work on other projects. Thanks for coming along on this incredible journey. Remember, you can go to the Evanston playlist to watch any or all of the 22 episodes in the Evanston Renovation series. I will put a link to the playlist down below. Or you can go to the playlist by clicking on it over here. Be sure to join me next time. I'm Roy Smith. Until then, happy railroading.